Greetings to everyone. Hope you all are hail and hearty. I am Urjaswita Priyadarshini Gaur, an undergraduate from MBM Engineering College, Jodhpur. And in this module, we are going to be covering the solutions to sample paper number two, questions from 11th to 16th. So without any further ado, let's get started. So the first question says, define valency, atomic number, and mass number. Now, as I always tell you, before solving any question, go by the fundamentals. So the fundamentals of valency, atomic number, and mass number are as follows. Number valency is commonly defined as the combining capacity of an element and is usually measured by the number of hydrogen atoms combined or displaced. That is, um, if, uh, just uh, for example, um, we have an element, say, 2, 8, 2. This is going to be the electronic configuration of that element. Now, if you know this element is nothing but magnesium, it has a number of protons of 12, so that is the atomic number makes 12. And now you can see if I apply the octet rule to this, and if, if I lose these two electrons to some other element, I might get the the value, uh, the electronic configuration to be 2 comma 8, which is going to satisfy the octet rule and hence give my element magnesium a stability. And then when it gives those two electrons to any other atom, it becomes a magnesium plus two atom, magnesium plus two atom. And now you can say that this plus two is the valency of this magnesium atom. And this is the combining capacity of magnesium because when it combines with two other elements, it's going to have a, a, an octet configuration, it is going to have a noble gas configuration, and it is going to be stable. The next is atomic number. So atomic number is defined as the number of protons present in the nucleus of the element's atom. The number of nucleus, uh, for example, if I try to make you visualize, this is your nucleus, this is going to be comprised of both protons as well as the neutrons and this is then going to be surrounded by a lot of discrete energy shells or orbits uh, where in which you will have your electrons embedded and these are going to revolve around your nucleus right so these shells are then labeled as k shell for n is equal to one then you have an l shell which is n is equal to two and so on and so forth now, in this question, we are just talking about, we just uh, bothered about the nucleus. So, nucleus is comprising of your protons as well as your neutrons. And those protons are protons of positively charged uh, subatomic particles. They have a charge of plus 1e and they have a mass which is less than your uh, neutron. And um, the third part says, uh, what is mass number? Then mass number is nothing but the number of nucleons present in the nucleus. Now, just what I told you about the proton plus neutron combinedly is what is called a neutron. This combined term is the, is the nucleon. So the total number of proton plus the total number of neutron is going to be your mass number. That is, it's going to be, uh, so if you say your mass number is A, then it's going to be, A is going to be equal to Z then the number of protons plus n, which is equal to your number of neutrons. And you can understand this better by looking at this figure, the valency is the number of bonds which are formed by an atom with another element. So as I told you, magnesium, it has a valency of two, aluminum is a valency of three, hydrogen has a valency of one, nitrogen has a valency of three, and so on. And in this case, uh, it's the case of oxygen, wherein you see if this is oxygen, it has eight atomic number. That means for an uncharged atom, you have the number of protons in oxygen to be equal to eight, and so is the number of equal to electrons as well, because the atom is uncharged. And in this case, you can see this is sodium. This is your mass number. Now, this mass number is going to be a combined term of the number of protons as well as the number of neutrons. So mass number is nothing but 23 here. So you can say that it has 11 protons and 12 neutrons. So this is how they are symbolically represented. So the next time you see the symbol, you should be able to differentiate between mass number as well as atomic number. So let's move on to the second question, which says, draw and label the different parts of a cell. Now what is cell? Cell is the basic unit, is the building block of a body. And cells are present both in plants as well as animals, and both the cell structures are different. 
Here, if you see, this is a structure of a cell. This is the diagram of the cell in which you can see. Now, for, we'll start, we'll study each and every part uh, just in brief. Um, this is your rough endoplasmic reticulum. You can see these rough um, um, projections over this endoplasmic reticulum. Similarly, you have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum and why these two are different because it doesn't have any projections like this over here. So this is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This is your vacuole. And this is your plasma membrane. This is going to be the selective membrane. This is going to allow uh, only selective particles to move in and out of the cell. Then you have uh, some polyribosomes here. Then you have uh, your nuclear pores here. And then you have some centrioles, a mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, a Golgi body or a Golgi complex here. Then you have a nucleus. This is the whole thing is called the nucleus. It's going to have a chromatin material here. And then you have some lysosomes and a central over here. This picture is same as this one, but this is a colorful representation in which you can easily understand the figures as well, uh, where this is your Golgi vesicles. These are your smooth endoplasmic reticulums. And this is going to be a rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is your nucleus. This is your nucleolus, which is inside your nucleus. This is uh, your uh, amyloplast or your starch grain. This is your large central vacuoles. And this is in case of plants, right? Uh, this is cytoplasm. This is a mitochondria. Then you have a rep. Uh, then you have refined crystals. You have juice crystals. You have a chloroplast here because this is a plant cell. Then you need a chloroplast. And then you have a vacuole membrane here. You have a Golgi apparatus right here. Then you have a cell membrane, which is the selective membrane again. And this is your cell wall. I hope this was clear to you. Now we move on to the next question which says three ways in which diseases can spread along with an example or a bodybuilder lifts a dumbbell of 10 kgs and raises it 2 meters above the ground. Calculate the work done by him on lifting the weight. Now the approach to this question is that we are going to divide this question into two separate parts. The part A, we are going to be talking about the three ways in which the disease can spread along with an example. And then in the next part, we'll discuss this numerical portion and calculate the work done. So first, let's discuss the first part. Uh, diseases can be spread by. Now, there are basically three ways. We are just going to discover uh, the, discuss three uh, methods right here. First, it is transferred through the air where disease causes microbes are usually transferred as a release as a result of people sneezing or coughing. Example is your common cold. And the latest example is going to be your coronavirus. And the second question, the second uh, method of transmission is through water, where cholera is causing microbes enter your water supplies and then your human body and they, they cause damage to different organs. And your example to this is diarrhea or dehydration. And then you have a physical contact between two, two organisms which involve activities like handshakes and it may also transfer to insects and animals and this example to this uh, sort of a transmission mode is AIDS or malaria. And in the part B of the question was that a bodybuilder lifts a dumbbell of 10 kgs and raises it 2 meters above the ground. Calculate the work done by him on lifting the weight. So here we have been given the mass of the dumbbell. This is your dumbbell of 10 kgs has been lifted to a height of 2 meters, right? This is what has been given to us. There's a 10 kg dumbbell. There's a 10 kg dumbbell which has been lifted to a 2 meter height. This is the displacement. S is equal to 2 meters. And now work done has to be calculated. So work done has a formula to it, which is nothing but F into S. That is force into the displacement. Right, the displacement value has been directly given to us to be two meters, right? It has been directly given to us. We have to calculate the force. The force can be nothing in this case, but mass into the G, that is the acceleration due to gravity in this case. Therefore, this 10 is going to be multiplied by 10 meter per second square, and then it's going to be multiplied by two. Uh, I must tell you that the exact value of G is going to be 9.81 meter per second square. But here they have approximately put it equal to 10. You can use it 10 if, un, unless it's specified in the question. So here they had used a, a 10 kg force multiplied by your G, which is 10 again. And then you have the displacement value. So it gives you 
10 kg meter per second square and this is going to be the into meters here, right here and then you can convert it into standard units called 200 newton meters which is nothing but joule one newton meter is nothing but joule so your work done is 200 joules and now i hope you'll be able to solve all such type of questions so the next question is say three reasons why atmosphere is essential for life now, the most important three reasons of why atmosphere is essential for rise of are that first, the atmosphere helps in maintaining the temperature of the earth because we humans can survive only in a, a special range of temperature and beyond the temperature range, we all will die. And it acts as a protective layer and helps in reducing the effects of UV radiations because UV radiations are harmful for human beings as well as for all sorts of um, uh, any, any sort of life uh, on earth is adversely affected by UV radiations, as well as it is also a protective shield against radiations and cosmic rays. Now, both of these rays are very harmful for uh, the sustainment of life on the Earth. So yes, atmosphere is protecting us from uh, these rays. And then it also protects us from um, the debris and small particles that have been uh, coming uh, due to this planetary creation and recreation and the collisions between these asteroid belts on the Earth by the solar system. So yes, it is protecting us from these debris and small particles. And um, you must have heard about that meteor, uh, the meteor falling on the Earth and that resulted into the extinction of dinosaurs. And then this is very, very much similar to that, but uh, the atmosphere can hold up to a very small range that that meteor that had fell was huge. And this, the last uh, reason can be that atmosphere also serves as an important purpose as a medium for the movement of water. Yes, obviously we need a certain amount of water vapor, to sustain life and atmosphere sustains that much. Now this is uh, um, a brief, um, example it's a brief um, diagram which can show all the different layers of atmosphere you have troposphere then you have stratosphere then you have mesosphere and then you have thermosphere and finally you have your space right here so we are living on the ground then we have a mount everest which is very near to the troposphere and then where the pl planes are flying you have your stratosphere when your meteors are falling on the earth you have your mesosphere and finally you have a thermosphere which is uh, very close to the aerospace Let's move on to the next question, which is explain what is genetic manipulation and list out its benefits for crops. So genetic manipulation refers to a process of uh, scientifically developing better varieties of crops that will produce a good yield. That can happen through hybridization or by introducing a new gene between dissimilar crops. It's a technology that involves inserting DNA into the genome of an organism to produce a genetically modified plant, the new DNA is transferred into the plant cells and usually the cells are then grown into tissue culture where they develop into plants. Right. So the benefits of uh, genetic uh, modification include a higher yield of crops, they have a better quality as well as they have crops which have wider availability and adaptability. So this is, uh, this is going to be an example that you can understand this whole concept better. Uh, this is your genetic code and it has an organism A. This is your genetic code with an organism B. And when you have a genetic modification of this, you get another desired result, A plus B, which is a genetically modified object. And um, this is how you get your um, uh, wanted set of combination of uh, desirable properties into your desired result right here by mixing the two organisms with uh, desirable properties. And the next question is, are plants and animal tissues the same? Name the different types of animal tissues and describe the key function of each tissue or uh, give five differences between a plant and an, uh, between a plant and an animal cell. Now we're going to divide this question again into two parts. The first part we are going to be um, uh, uh, looking at the difference between a plant and an animal tissue and in the second part we'll look at the difference between uh, a plant and an animal cell. So the first part says since the body of plants and animals are constructed in a different manner uh, to carry out different activities in a different way 
the tissues are also totally different in that. Animal tissues are going to include very connective tissues, epithelial tissues, muscular tissues, and nervous tissues. And um, they have connective tissues which are responsible for connecting the different parts of the body. Then you have epithelial tissues which are helping in protecting the organs as well as exchanging materials between body and external environment. And then you have muscular tissues which can contain elongated cells or muscular fiber for the movement. And then you have nervous tissues which are transmitting stimulus in one part of the body to the other part of the body. So definitely your animal tissues and your plant tissues are not the same. In this diagram you can see. Now this is um, a transverse view of this of the stem of a plant in which you have a structure like this observed under a microscope. You have a xylem, you have a phloem, these are all vascular tissues, then you have a ground tissue, and then you have your dermal tissue or your epidermis. Whereas uh, this is an example of a specific organ or like stomach, it has a smooth muscle tissue, it has a loose connective tissue, it has a nervous tissue for the nervous communication with the brain, and then it has blood and columnar epithelium cells. So yes, all the plants and animal tissues, since they perform different activities, so yes, they are completely different from each other. And uh, what is the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell is that plant cells, they have fixed shape and they're most rectangular, and animal cells are irregular in shape, but they're somewhat round. Plant cells contain chloroplasts, again, yes, because they need chloroplasts and chlorophyll to uh, make... Um, their food uh, using the sunlight, but chloroplasts are absent in animal cells. We don't need chloroplasts. And then plant cells store energy in the form of starch, but energy is for, stored in the form of glycogen in animal cells. And then uh, the plant cells have both cell walls as well as cell membrane, whereas animal cells only have cell membranes. And lastly, plant cells have plastids. Uh, plant cells, sorry, do not have plastids, whereas uh, animal cells do have plastids. So this was the basic difference between plant cell and animal cell. These are the major ones. And with this, we come to the end of the module. I hope you were able to understand the fundamentals. And uh, I hope you will be able to apply this knowledge to other, other questions as well. So keep learning, keep growing, and we'll meet in the next module. Thank you so much for being a patient audience.